All right, Ben, I want to start with you because what Hillary Clinton is doing there is basically continuing this the 2016 campaign. So it doesn't end. So she, she is on her book tour. She has every right to say what she wants to say. But does this crystallize for you something you say in your podcast regularly, that this is an ongoing thing that doesn't end and it might not end well? It never ends. We're in a vortex of stupid, and it's reduced to a black hole of idiocy, and we're never going to escape it now. We're just going to be ceaselessly reliving 2016. Look, uh, President Trump did a couple of things in that Alabama rally. The first thing that he did was he condemned people kneeling during the anthem, which I think is totally fine. The second thing he did, where he called for people to be fired, is not appropriate from a government official. When Hillary Clinton, however, suggests that this is rooted in racism, listen, when I think that President Trump has wrong-footed on racial issues, I've been very clear about it, but I don't see the racial racist intent here. If she's talking about people who are white that Trump has attacked, she could look in the mirror because Trump does that every single day and continues to do that nearly a year after the elections. This isn't about race. This is about Trump felt like he had a, an issue that he got to club. And so he was going to club that issue like a baby seal. I and mean, that's essentially what he did in Alabama. But Richard, I, I, one of the things I tried to do today was to stick, take a step back. So I didn't grow up going to football games. We went to rodeos where I grew up in Wyoming and we always stood the anthem, and I, one of the things I've always loved about it was that I always felt sort of like when I was in church, where you have that moment of unity, everybody together, then there's like this common thread, and then maybe afterwards there's a problem. But I try to also be open-minded and look and see, do, is the original protest, which was about the complaint that Kaepernick had, that black, uh, that white officers were being let off the hook for unjust killings of black, especially children. Uh, or, you know, youth. And I'm trying to understand, do they see this as a racist attack by President Trump? They do. And let's let's talk about one case in particular, Tamir Rice, a 12 year old boy in Ohio. Police drove up and shot him in the face. He had a toy gun. He was 12 years old. He was shot in the face. There was no freeze. There was no put your weapon down. He was shot in the face by police. Right. It was on tape. Everybody saw it. The country watched in shock and horror. We could talk about Eric Garner. I can go on and on and on. Colin Kaepernick decided to kneel, and that is where we were, right? Donald Trump this weekend then took it further. First, he used inflammatory language. No president in American history that I know of, in recent history, since I've been alive, have ever, has ever used that type of language. Every American, the, the ideal, the president of the United States should be a role model to every child. Right. I am 30 years old. I wouldn't use that language in front of my mother. I, my mom is watching tonight, which I won't, I won't repeat it. So the fact that we have a president that uses that language is, is, is disgusting. Right. So then let's move forward. He's saying these individuals should be fired for using their right to protest. People have tried to make it about the troops. They've tried to make it about the flag. They've tried to make it about our uh, they've tried to make it about the anthem. That is not what this protest is about. This protest is about racial injustice for people of color in this country. And that is what these athletes are using their platform to do, to protest racial injustice. Okay. Muhammad Ali did it. Jackie Robinson did it. Jesse Owens did it. But Martin Luther King did it. And when they did it, it was unpopular. Protesting a lot of times is unpopular. But our First Amendment right allows us to be unpopular. Absolutely. But, and so but what here's the something that I wonder about, Ben, which is that the original protest from Kaepernick had basically, in my opinion, and I don't watch a ton of sports, but it had been sort of dying out. We weren't hearing about, about it. Yep. He wasn't getting picked up by a team. It wasn't out there. And the President Trump, sort of, I, th I think, sort of riffed on it on Friday night, and it became this explosive thing. And the left sent, tends to overreact to President Trump. And then what you get at the end is basically people saying, yeah, I think you should stand for the national anthem, and we should probably try to continue to do more to, eat, to uh, calm racial tensions in the country, but the national anthem doesn't seem the place to do that. Yeah, I mean, th th there's a series of overreactions that happens here. So first of all, just to talk about the underlying issue with regard to police brutality being systemic across the country and then citing a case like Tamir Rice. Out here in California, there was a white homeless guy named Kelly Thomas who was beat to death on tape, and the officers eventually ended up getting off. Okay, that was not about racism. There is such a thing as police brutality having nothing to do with race. Wrong. There were some 760 shootings of people by the police this year, according to the Washington mm -hmm. Post. Nine of them were of unarmed black people. So the idea that there is this wide spate of these shootings happening across the country police is brutality just 
not true. Wrong, but no beyond matter that, if it's black or you know, the white. idea, okay, what, what basically happened here is that Colin Kaepernick started a protest. It didn't turn into a movement. It was basically dying out. Most players didn't like it. The vast majority of Americans didn't like it. And then President Trump decided to bring it up again. And then the left reacted, as they always do to President Trump, by falling directly into whatever trap I think he inadvertently set. Trump says, uh, you know, anyone who anyone who kneels for the national anthem should be fired. And so now everybody on the left goes, well, then everybody should kneel for the national anthem. They basically react to him the same way that my three-year-old daughter reacts to me when I'm using reverse psychology on him. You, it's just not smart. I mean, if you're on the so, left and you're trying to create a PR movement in favor of this movement, it doesn't seem to me like the smartest way to do that is to create the image of everybody kneeling during the national so, anthem and the booing audiences across the country, the booing stadium audiences across the country uh, seem to be good evidence that this is not a protest movement that is actually gaining steam. It's actually undercutting its own message. If you want to protest, you know, perceived police brutality, there are police stations right down so that, the way. My sense is that this doesn't, doesn't end like well. The smartest way to do that. My sense is that this probably this does not end well for the NFL. I'm not exactly sure how it ends. I hope that it does. But Richard, from your perspective, do you think that this has actually been helpful? Well, I, I want to make a couple of points here. I don't think this is a left or right issue. I mean, if you look at some of the people who are protesting, so today at the Dallas Cowboys game, the owner of the Cowboys, which is not the left by any stretch or means of the imagination, mm -hmm. neither is the owner of the Patriots, neither is many of these quarterbacks who hang out with Donald Trump, who take pictures with Donald Trump, who golf with Donald Trump, all understand that there's racial inequities in this country, and they said so, and they also have protested the national anthem. So let's be very clear, this is not a left or right issue. What Donald Trump did this weekend was he race baited. He walked out there, he called Colin Kaepernick's mother an SOB, and in, when engaging in this type of destructive racial debating in, in front of a group in Alabama, which is his base, he framed an argument that set up a situation where he would upset a group of Americans African-Americans, right, that got us to this place where people, white people and black people said, not left or right, white African-American, white people and black people, all Americans like, this is wrong, Mr. President. And that's why 200 members of the NFL said, this, there's something wrong here and we're going to protest this. Okay. And, and I think that's part of the problem with this president, right? That's what, this is what we're, this is the problem that we're having here. He continues to put his foot in his mouth over and over again. And then there are folks like Ben who says, oh, it's the left. No, it's not the left. It's common sense Americans saying, this president is wrong. And then he goes out and he says, oh, well, look, the, pe the race car drivers are okay, but how many black race car drivers are there? There's only four. So there you have it. Okay, right? let me, I'm going to give Ben the last word, if, if, if that's all right. Ben, how do, how do we all move past this? If you had you know, your prescription pad, you could write a prescription for America for moving past this. What do, how do we do it? Because you've talked about how the culture wars are basically just driving us apart. And I did think of you uh, this weekend. I knew that you were uh, observing the, the Jewish holidays. And I thought, oh, my gosh, when, when he gets back online, he's just going to see this cascade of more culture wars. <laughs> Yeah, it, it just never ends. I mean, I think the only way to get past this is to go back to the consensus that we sort of had before. To suggest that Trump started this culture war is not true. He escalated the culture war. Kaepernick started this particular thing. I mean, this was a controversy a year ago. So to pretend so the police that Trump didn't started start by shooting us to me right in the face. To, if we want to get back to consensus here, then we, need to, then we need to go back to where I think public opinion actually is, which is it's inappropriate to protest the national anthem or during the national anthem, protest all you want in other venues. And, and at the same time, no one should be fired for this. I mean, that's the basic opinion. I'm not saying that Kaepernick doesn't have the right to do it or any of these players don't have the right to do it. They certainly have the right to do it. Owners have the right to react how they want to react. The president should not be calling on people to be fired for expressing their protest opinions any way they see fit. With that said, I think there are only very few common symbols that we hold together, and those are things like the flag and the national anthem and, and football, by the way. And as those disappear, as those become politicized, the country becomes almost irreconcilable. Oh, but let's not do that, right? Every, I think the three of us agree, and maybe the people watching. We do. I mean, we, we agree, Dane. I think what, the one thing I will add to that, I think, is we have to go back to the beginning here and figure out how we level the playing field and solve injustices, right? And that solves by stopping state state sanctioned violences that's happening to both white and black people by over the excessive use of force by police departments. Yeah. Well, there's a, a lot to debate there, too. All right, um, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Or have any blowback What here. should you do? What we should do is we should put military advisors on the ground, particularly in Kurdistan, where we help out some of the folks who actually want to defend the country. And look, if, if we actually care about the status of the country, the last thing we should be doing is helping the Iranians invade the southern half of the country and then helping the Sunnis invade the northern half of the country. This is exactly what the left wanted with regard to Iraq way back in the middle of the last decade. 
decade. They wanted this to turn into Vietnam. Vietnam was a war that was won until Mil we cut funding and pulled out. Military and this was also a war that was won until we cut funding and pulled out. Go ahead, uh, uh, Richard. Larry, that's utterly, 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 completely not true. Right? And if you listen to the folks like John McCain, who always believes we should arm the rebels, which is his solution to everything, and putting our men and women in harm's way once again to solve a quagmire of a situation that we've created. Let's be very clear about this. It was created under George W. Bush. This president has brought our, <laughs> our men and women back home in the safety of America. And now we've got to figure out a solution. And to be honest with you, this government, the Iraqi government, has got to stand up. This cannot always be America's nightmare. The Iraqi government has to stand up and say, we're going to take control. What this president, what the president of Iraq needs to do is reach out to the Sunnis, reach out to the Shias, make concessions, and find a way to run his government. We do it here in America. They do it in India. They do it in Pakistan. They do it all across the world. People come together. Different factions come together and rule a country equally. And this president, the president of Iraq, hasn't been able to do that. And we have to be held accountable for his actions before we put our men and women back in harm's way. Why is it our problem? It, it was, it's our problem because, to a certain extent... Because we invaded them. Well, <laughs> yeah, yes, because we invaded them, but also beyond that, because once we're there and you make promises to people who are now being mowed down in the street, by the way, if you feel no moral obligation about that, but you feel a moral obligation about 270 girls who get kidnapped by Boko Haram in Nigeria, then I question where exactly your moral feelings lie. Because the fact is tens of thousands of people are going to get killed there. Possibly, uh, certainly hundreds of thousands have already been moved into exile, essentially. Uh, you want to send advisors. I, I certainly want to send advisors. What else do you want to send advisors? Uh, airstrikes on, on ISIS. Airstrikes. We can, we can airstrike Gaddafi's forces in Libya in a country we have nothing to do with, but we won't airstrike ISIS. Don't go away. The debate continues with Ben and Richard right after this. What's wrong with that, Richard? Why not airstrike? Well, well, listen, I think... I would like for him to define what military advisors mean, one, because we've already trained the Iraqi military, and it's not our fault the Iraqi military is surrendering as fast as possible, right? That's not our issue. That's not our problem. Now, where I do agree with him is I think that I, don't, I have no problem, I think this president has no problem with some sort of drone warfare, sending some drones over there to strike ISIS. But with that being said, we need a, a, a solution where all the parties are at the table. And unfortunately, that can only happen when the Iraqi government stands up here. Well, that, that also happens, actually, and was happening. When when the American military was there. I mean, if you read the pieces in The New Yorker by a great reporter who's, who's actually on the left, he was talking in, in specific detail about the fact that when the U.S. military was there, they were speaking every day, every day, with, the, with, with Maliki, so and they were telling him. how long do you him, want the U.S. military to be there is the question. If the U.S. military there is, for, is there for decades, we can live how long do you want our men and women, How long do you want our men and women to be put in harm's way? Let me ask you this. How many American men and women were you willing to let die for no reason now? Because now the, now the country is gone, right? So you got 4,500 American men and women who died there, and their blood is worth nothing because the country is gone. And veterans are saying this. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Well, first of all, we shouldn't have been there in the first place. And I, well, you, you can not, argue that, but the bottom line is that once the war was point. won, why but give it rate, back? How, mu how much more American blood do you want to shed for a, a, co for a conflict that is not, not our conflict and a government that is literally irresponsible. You will, don't you think uh, the American public will not support troops on the ground? You know I, 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 think, I think at this point you're probably right. The American public will not by support troops margin. on the ground. By a wide margin. Because this, is a, this has become a country that has now slipped into a pre-9-11 mentality, which is why we are now going to surrender Afghanistan back to the Taliban and Iraq to a combined force of al-Qaeda slash ISIS in the north and Iran in the, in the south. All right, some <laughs> other political things. Your reaction to the, to the defeat of, uh, of Mr. Cantor. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. I think that it has a couple of ramifications. It, it once again shows kind of the, the difference between the establishment Republican Party and the grassroots. That election really had nothing to do with the Tea Party. The Tea Party didn't spend any money in it, and the Tea Party really didn't do much in that race. That was much more about Cantor not being in his district a lot and being a little bit out of touch. As far as the immigration issue, I think it's a great thing for Democrats because now you're going to see President Obama do what he's wanted to do all along. He's going to claim he has no partners on the Republican side of the aisle on immigration reform, and then he's going to move toward executive action. He's going to threaten the American people if they don't elect Democrats who are allies of so his before November, he's going he's gonna to amnesty 11 million votes. That defeat votes. will help Democrats. Absolutely, it'll help Democrats. What do you think, Richard? Well, I didn't know immigration reform was a threat, but hey, uh, who's, at, who, who's asking the questions here? But, but Larry, listen, I think where I, where I do agree is I think the reason why Eric Cantor lost his race is because, once again, we all know the, the, the truth of the line that all politics are local. Uh, and Eric Cantor just didn't play the local ground game. This guy, he, he outspent this guy on ads and all this other stuff, but when it came to talking to people of his district, he just didn't get it done. Now, but what I think this does say for the broader Republican Party um, on immigration and, and on other issues, on raising the minimum wage, is that what you're going to find is a 
more divided government in Washington. If Eric Cantor, who is as conservative as conservative can be, who, st who sort of tipped his foot into water on immigration reform, can lose his seat, then all Republicans are going to feel as though they're vulnerable. They're going to go all the way to the right, and we're going to have a dysfunctional government because Republicans refuse to come to the table and work with this president. Why can't we have immigration reform? I mean, the reason we can't... George Bush led the parade. I mean, listen, I'd be fine with immigration reform. I think most Americans actually agree on immigration reform. On this basic, immigrants. On this ba exactly. <laughs> on this basic count, right? You can't have... This, uh, at a very basic level, you can't have a welfare state with open borders, right? Because people come across the border and take advantage of the welfare state. So what you have to do first is you have to secure the border, and then you figure out what to do with the people here, whether that means pathway to citizenship or whether that means just legal residency. And I think that pretty much everybody agrees on that. The problem is that the president has been so lax on border security that people don't trust his enforcement of border security. So this has been the well, sticking point. Well, well. Wait a second here. Now, first, I don't think that border security and a pathway to citizenship are mutually exclusive. Those two things can happen simultaneously at the same time. Why? And that is the compromise. That is, that is the place of compromise for Democrats and Republican, Larry. They can happen at the same time. We can build a fence. We can build a wall. We can build electric fence if that's what they want. But at the same time, we need to provide a pathway to citizenship for those 11 million that are in the shadows. The Republican Party's problem is, is they cannot get a pathway through citizenship out of the United States House of Representatives, whether they like it or not, whether we beef up the border or not, whether we put uh, not Marine, Marine Team 6 on the border, they would still not be able to pass a pathway to citizenship. That's simply not true. If you secured the border, people that would pass a pathway Look to citizenship. The count the votes. I promise you, I know the Republican Party pretty well. And, and if, you, if you were to secure the border, then you would be able to pass a pathway to citizenship. You would. It's, well, it, why it, can't those happen? Why, why are those two things mutually exclusive? Why are they connected? Because if we're dealing with immigration, we're dealing with immigration as a total issue. They're not separate issues. The, of course they're separate issues, because the fact is that if no, you do not... not. Okay, it's fine. It's all about you're maintaining right. our border and having uh, immigration control. So, 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 so you're right. Let's assume you're right. And, and we'll, completely, we'll completely connect them. Okay? But the way we'll connect them is we won't, we won't have any border security. Amnesty for everybody. Is there a problem or no? That's not what, but see, but, but this is this is this is where we, this is exactly where they go to, Larry. Every time we have this, this discussion, this is where we say, go to. Why don't you explain why forever. they have to be and connected? That is not. Well, wait a second. Wait a second. That is not what's in the Senate bill. In the Senate bill, which is the Democratic solution, which has been endorsed by the President and all the Democrats in the United States Senate, that bill strengthens our border. It increases border security, and at the same time, it provides a very, very, very long pathway to citizenship that takes almost ten years. It is completely and totally bipartisan. Yet still, Republicans in the House won't even bring the bill to the floor for a vote. Richard, that I just tells you question. right there, Larry, that they don't agree with the pathway to citizenship. Why, ha I ha why can't they vote? Uh, honestly, I have one question in all of this. Seriously, just one question. Why not just secure the border and then put a pathway to citizenship why in? Why can't those happen at the same time? Why don't you answer my question instead of asking me back why? I, I just explained to you why they can't. Uh, here's why they can't happen at the same time. As you secure the border, the border remains somewhat open. People cross the border because they feel that if they get in before the deadline, if they get in before the border is secure, then they are somehow included have in the pathway to the citizenship. Bill? Of course I've read the bill. And not only have I read the bill, well, the I've been watching what's happening on the board with tens of thousands but of children the crossing the, the border in anticipation of amnesty. Wait, because we have no, what do you think is happening? there's no law right now. But in oh, the Senate no bill, right we, talk about, we talk You're about right, there's who no law against crossing the border illegally. We, in the Senate bill, we talk about who qualifies for a pathway to citizenship. And those deadlines do not, do not apply to those individuals across the border And how tomorrow, are you going to magically determine that, Richard? Today. Do they have a magical, like... It's do they in have the a, bill. Right, they have a, read the bill. I've read the bill, Richard. Can you explain uh, to me when you... you haven't read it correctly. When, when, you determine, when you determine who has crossed the border when, I was unaware that everybody who crosses the border has a no, barcode saying when they came across. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read the bill and have you